Um, welcome everyone. As most of you know, I'm Zoe from OpenSight and I'm looking at the wrong camera. Um, <laughs> let's start again. So I'm Zoe from OpenSight Hampshire. I'm visually impaired myself. Um, showing off some lovely sunglasses as I look at the screen. Um, so we have created these baking sessions um, to, with Penny to help people um, get back in the kitchen and share their ideas in the kitchen uh, when you're living with sight loss. And they've been pretty popular um, through when we were doing them through lockdown. So we're going to continue these baking sessions um, for, for much longer because they're, they're proving to be very useful. And it's nice to interact uh, with other vision impaired people from everywhere, not just Hampshire. We've had people from um, Australia, America, Holland, um, Scotland, everywhere that's joined these baking sessions with us. So it's, it's really nice to know uh, that there's more VIPs out there and, you know, we can all interact together. Um, I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas and, and a good new year to start this 2022 off. Um, you'll find the collection of our previous baking sessions. We started this in February 2021. Um, previous uh, videos are on our YouTube channel under playlist of baking sessions with Penny Melville Brown. So today we will be uh, looking at roast vegetables with Penny and Penny's going to give us some ideas on how to best cut vegetables up um, and so I'm going to pass over to Penny and I will speak to you all very soon. Penny. Okay good morning everyone. Um, you probably can't see me, I can't see you at all. I'm sitting down today because you, you may know that I was involved in a really grotty accident about four years ago and standing up for a long time is, is very painful for me. But also because um, I've got lots of stuff all about me and that, because we're doing this roast vegetables. I sent you a recipe and in reality you can use nearly anything you like in this. Um, so we're going to start off today with the hard vegetables which I'm going to parboil before they go into the roasting pan with the softer vegetables. But we're, going, we're really here to use vegetables as an excuse to look at all sorts of cutting techniques that we might want to use that we can't see. So the first thing I'm going to start off with is I have a board. And it, it, this is my vegetable chopping board, um, which for those who could see, it's green, and it's got a little lip round one side of it. So that means that things don't roll off it so easily. And because I can't see it's green, I've cut a couple of little notches in the side of this vegetable board so that I can feel that this is, this is the one I want for today. And although I pop it in the dishwasher from time to time, because it's just polyurethane or something, um, I can still smell it's a bit garlicky, it's a bit oniony. So by having it for vegetables, I don't muddle it up with when I'm cutting fruit. And I have um, a separate one for fruit and I have a separate one that I use for meat and fish. So I'm trying to keep all of those ingredients separate from each other. Let me just chat to you a little bit about implements. Now I have here a short knife. And the blade is probably, oh gosh, if I do metric, it's too complicated. It's probably <laughs> about a six inch blade. And I use that because it's a little short, sharp, light vegetable knife. And I use that for everything really, because it's so light, I can feel what I'm cutting. Um, my sous chef, Alan, has got some huge knives but they're so heavy, I can't feel what's on the end of the knife. And I'm using the knife in a way like an extra finger. Um, it's a sharp knife. I'm rubbing my thumb on it and it's just catching my skin. So I know it's sharp. You know, I'm not cutting it, but I'm just rubbing my 
thumb across it and you can just feel it catching on my skin. And I've got this delightful little sharpener. It's like a, a barrel, which is about ooh, a couple of inches across and it suction connects to the work surface. And then you just draw the knife through the sharpening bits. I found this the very best sharpener for me because it's small, it's flexible. I could put it somewhere out of the way, bring it down onto the work surface, clump it on, um, sharpen up a knife and then put this away. So that's a really good little sharpener. You could use all sorts of other ones, but I think something that is very stable so that um, I don't have to worry too much about holding this on the work surface because it's nice and firm. All I'm using my left hand, because I'm right-handed, is to locate it. And then I'm drawing my knife through it. And let me just let, I don't know if you can hear this. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's, so I'm not using my left hand other than to tell my right hand where the sharpener is. So that's my vegetable knife. The other thing I've got here is a classic potato peeler. And I also, just to really make you jealous, have <laughs> a potato peeler sharpener. Ah. What this is, it's a piece of, oh, God knows, some sort of metal or stone or sharpening thing. And it's about four inches long, uh, inch and a half wide. And the important thing is it's very thin. It must be not much more than a millimeter thick. And so therefore I can put it into the sharp, into the um, potato peeler and I can put it in, inside the blade and just, can you hear that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me sharpening it? Yeah. And that way I can just, again, run my thumb across it and I can just feel it not cutting me, but just catching. And these are quite sharp. They're sharp enough. Penny, that could be emery paper you've got there, is it? I think it's, um, what do they call? Do they call them sharpening stones? This is- this All is right, yeah. This is, let me, listen. That's, that's ah. the sharpener. It, ah. This is stone or metal. So yeah. putting, it comes in a little sleeve and I keep it in my knife drawer. Um, I've got a couple of other implements here I wanted to show you. I've talked about the classic um, potato peeler. I've also got one of those ones, like a Y. Oh, I've got one of those. Yeah, yes. yeah. So it's got yeah. a flat blade. Now, I very rarely use this, but today we're going to do a butternut squash, and I, I'm going to use it on that. And again, I've sharpened that blade today. So again, can you hear me? That's, just, not, uh, yeah. that's my skin just catching onto that blade. So I know it's sharp. You're brave. <laughs> another Y-shaped one. And this has got teeth. I'm just going to run my finger along the teeth. Can you hear that? Yeah. And this is if you want to cut baton carrots. Or supposing you were wanting to make coleslaw. And so you could run this down a carrot and you get little slithers of carrot. Oh, yeah. Or you could do it with celeriac. And I would make a celeriac remoulade, which has got some um, dressing on it and very fine slithers of a hard vegetable. Yeah, so, that's quite hard to cut, celeriac. Yes, yeah. So something like that is quite useful. And the other thing I've got here is like a great big pencil sharpener. So this is actually a cone and it's a, the hole. I can get three finger widths into the hole and down the side of that is a blade. So if I'm doing, I could make courgettini. So I put my, stuff my courgette in it, twist the pencil sharpener around it and out comes long strands of courgette, or I do it with carrot, 
Um, and if I'm making a winter salad, then I would have just slithers, long slithers of carrot. And I find that really useful. Is it like a spiralizer? It's like a spiralizer, and I've got a spiralizer as well. But I find this one um, very handy. It's, it's, it's small, it's hand shaped, and it works for me. Spiral and, and, and the other big thing is, it's really easy to clean. Spiralizers, <laughs> you've got about 400 pieces with all these washing and drying. So I just wanted to show you those implements. So, what I'm going to do today is we are going to start with some hard vegetables. And I've got a carrot here. And what I'm going to do first is I've got my, there's the carrot on the board. And my finger, I'm measuring from the end of the carrot. So I'm just inside the little rounded, the little rounded bit. And I'm just going to cut straight down. So that cuts off where the carrot had its little leaves at the beginning. At the other end, I'm cutting off the pointy end. And what that is telling me when I come to sharpen it, we can peel it, is that my peeler will go right to the very end of the carrot. So I know I've done it on both, got all the peel off it. And I'm just whizzing down with a peeler, that one I sharpened up. And you can hear me just whizzing that off. And you're all sitting there thinking, God, I, we can peel up a carrot. We can peel a potato. And of course you can, it's completely easy. What I've got here by the side of me is a box. So I'm putting all my peelings in there. So they're all out of the way. So I'm trying always to keep my work surface pretty clean. Now for these carrots, we're going to parboil these with some of the other hard vegetable. Yeah, so, I was going to ask you that. Can I do it in the microwave? Because I've got mine ready. Yes, 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 so, absolutely. Just a little how, bit of water. How long much. for? Well, don't do it yet, because we're going to cut this carrot up. So I'm measuring the carrot between my little finger and my thumb, working out where it's about halfway. And again, I've got my fingernail Actually, I'm just gently digging it into the carrot and I'm running my knife down my fingernail. So I've got the flat side of the knife against my fingernail and I'm cutting away from my fingers. And that's it done. So that's in half. Then I'm going to cut it in length, in half again lengthwise. And I'm feeling it with my hands to know where I am. And then I, each of those segments, I'm cutting again in half lengthwise. So I've ended up with fairly hefty carrot battens because they're going to be cooked um, firstly parboiled and then in the oven. They could be quite strong, quite wedgy. Um, if I was going to make um, a roast vegetable tartlet, I would cut these smaller, but because I'm going to be serving roast vegetables um, as an accompaniment, I want people to be able to pick up a piece of roast vegetable, recognize what it is and taste what it is. When you cut things smaller, their tastes get more muddled up. So now I'm at the big piece of carrot. This is the bottom of the carrot. And I'm gonna cut this, I've cut it in half and I'm cutting, and can you hear me? I'm not being a rush, am I? No. I'm being quite slow, quite careful, because it's a sharp knife, and I'm a blind person. And the last thing I need is all this stuff all over the place. And here's the other one. These I'm cutting into three pieces lengthwise. So I'm ending up with a piece of carrot, each of these pieces of carrot is about two inches long. If you looked at it in profile, it's a wedge. Um, and that can very happily go into a box here. And I'm going to throw those in a minute. Or my sous chef is it's going to put it into um, the boiling water. We're going to bring it up to the boil and we're going to cook it for, um, oh, I don't know, 
just bring it back to the boil, really. We're only parboiling them. Here I've got what I think is a potato. It feels like a potato, slightly rough, and I've got little nubbly bits at each end. Taking my potato peeler, just going to whack off the peel. Now, one of the things, if you're blind and you're cooking, you need to be prepared. So I have in my drawer um, some plasters, and I either get those strips of plasters, which actually I prefer, those very long ones, and I like to have them pre-cut. So I've got a plaster, I can just go straight to the drawer, um, leaving a slightly bloody trail as I go. <laughs> and I do. Um, and what I have to be careful is if I'm doing things like this, um, they may be a bit bloody sometimes. And if I'm really lucky, I've got somebody here who will look at them and rinse them and say, no, no, yes, we've got all the blood off them. What I also <laughs> have, if I have damaged myself, is I have some of those cheap latex gloves because that way I can cover my hand if I'm bleeding again and I don't know it, um, it's going to bleed into the glove. Mm. Right, here's this potato. So I've peeled it and I'm balancing it and I'm actually putting a fingernail that my left hand, uh, first finger fingernail, which is just steadying it. I'm running down my fingernail, cutting away from my hand. There it goes. And then I'm going to cut that half a potato and I'm going to cut it into four quarters, each half. So it's into eighths, into my box. So I've got nice little pieces. And with all of this, we're thinking about how long is it going to take to cook? Um, and so some of these vegetables are harder and some of them are softer. So they'll take different times. I'm, I'm, I'm on the Zoom at the moment. I'll phone you back after that, I'm sure. Hi, <laughs> <Live> TV. <laughs> right, I'm on a parsnip now. So I've cut off the nose and now I'm cutting off the base, which is where the leaves would have been. And I'm not being mean. I want to make sure I get it all off because I can't see so well. Well, I can't see at all. Um, I, I don't want to be cautious with cutting off everything that is not going to be very appetizing. I'm peeling it from about halfway down to the nose because I know that if I try and do it all the way down, it's going to be too difficult. And I can feel when I'm peeling this parsnip, as I did with the carrots and the potato, where it's not peeled, it's rough and it's mm -hmm. dry. Where I've got the peel off, it's smooth and it's wet. Just that little bit of moisture. So I know that I've done that bit. I'm just feeling all around the bottom, just whizzing around, making sure I'm happy. And I'm turning it upside down and I'm peeling towards the, the heavy base bit where the leaves were. And because I've cut off the ends first, I'm putting the thumb of my right hand on that flat base. I'm pulling the peeler straight down towards it. And I know therefore I'm getting everything off to get a clean finish on my parsnip. And of course, vegetables are always interesting because they're not regular shapes. You know, you, you draw a carrot and it, a picture looks regular, but when you actually get down to grips with it, they all undulate a little. So you just have to be flexible and feel. And mm. there's nothing better than your hands for feeling things. Right, I've peeled my parsnip, peel into the box. Can I commend to you ice cream boxes? I use them all the time. You can get them on the internet and they are just wonderful for cooking with, um, putting your rubbish in, whatever. Because you can put a lid on it and then you're not going to drop it. Now, here's my parsnip. I'm Again, I've got my forefinger of my left hand. I've got the nail just giving me a little grip, running that knife down slightly away from me because of course the nail going that way and that's me through the nose of the parsnip and again I've now got all the fingers of my left hand I've got the thumb on one side of the nose 
and four fingers on the other. And actually, I've got my little finger at the far end, which is telling me where the end is. And I am just putting the knife through all those fingers and going down quite firmly, but not too fast. And so that's giving me two little pieces of parsnip. And if you looked at them and compared them with the carrot, they're a very similar shape and size. But of course, because they're parsnip, they're a different color. So, you know, people who could see would know that see the difference. We'll just taste it later. So there's that in. Right, now here's my parsnip. And because I've cut that end off flat, that's me banging it down on the board with onto the flat end. So I've got something really stable to cut on. I've got my knife at the top and I'm just gonna go down. That doesn't sound very even to me, but I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay, it. Lewis has joined the meeting. So I've cut that wedge of parsnip again into three more wedges. And they're like, um, what would we, like, like big chips, I suppose. Yeah. So now I'm gonna cut this parsnip into half again. And probably not a very accurate half, but you know, if you've got guests or members of the family who are so fussy about the shape of their parsnip pieces, they can go and eat it in their bedrooms, can't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, good Lord, this is only food. Let's not get too worried about it. So now there's the parsnip done. And that last piece is very chunky. So these are like homemade chips into the box ready for the boiling water, which Alan is about to put on. Now, here is the really killer bit. This is a swede. If I put it on the board with a little drop, you'll hear it. Can you hear how big that thing is? <laughs> Nightmare. So again, I've cut off the end. Not very well. I'm going to do it again. They're so hard, aren't they, to cut? So so yeah. I wanted to do some not so easy vegetables with you today because it's really simple for us to avoid these difficult things. So I'm now cutting down. Go slowly, go slowly. Keep your hand well out of the way. If you've got to go back and cut again, do that. Don't be, you know, you're not trying to be some master chef. You're trying to be somebody who cooks safely in their kitchen. So I'm taking my potato peeler and I'm peeling again up from about halfway on this swede. Not trying to do it all in one spell swoop. And I'm cutting it, peeling it off, checking with my fingers. I can feel the spaces that I've cut with the peeler. I can feel where it's, where it's wet because where the skin is still on, it's still rough and dry. So don't forget about all the things that you're cooking with. And as I cut this, as I peel it, I can smell it. I do like sweet. Well, yes, you could, we could do it like this in, um, it, as roast, but you can boil it or microwave it and um, mash it. I have one day I will show you my potato masher and I promise you you would you know yes you have to pay for a gadget but you would never bother with one of those hydraulic ones ever again it is just wonderful really easy to clean and does a fabulous job so if you've got a family who loves mashed potato you should get one right I'm just clearing my board again I am trying to keep things clean because it gives me less to slip on when I can't see, and I'm putting force on the board to do the cutting in a minute. So endlessly, I'm trying to be work in a clean place. So I'm just going around the other half of my Swede. You can hear it, can't you? Yeah. It's fibrous and hard. And um, I think they used to feed things like this. Is it mangle wurzels or something? Or something similar to cattle. Mm. And what, what peeler are you using? Is it the Y one or the, the No, I'm using just the ordinary potato peeler. 
okay. all of this. Because for me, I find it much easier. And what people don't realize is actually, when you're cooking a lot, you get very strong hands. And my hands are pretty strong. Um, you, you might, you know, I'm putting, if I'm feeling this now, I've nearly finished this Swede. I've got it locked Donna, in my left hand. Left got it locked in my left hand. And I'm using a lot of force, bringing, bringing that potato peeler up towards me to take off the last bit of skin. So be, be conscious of how much strength you're going to need, even for just peeling. Um, and as you do more, you'll just get stronger and stronger. So this is going to be quite tricky now because we've got this big heavy vegetable here, I'm just clearing the board, which is hard and is going to take quite a bit of force to cut it. And in many ways, if you could see well, you would use a bigger, stronger knife because yeah. it would smack through it. Yeah. And I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is put it on one of its flat ends and I'm going to go down with my knife and see what I can do. And can you hear me seesawing it down? Now I'm not cutting this right the way through in half and half. I've probably taken off a third. And that, to be honest, was all that I wanted to manage. And I'm gonna cut this now into chunks. Because again, this is hard. And so it's going to take longer to cook, like the carrot, because the actual fibrousness of it is much tougher than the potato or anything else that we've cut up so far. So this is me chopping up the swede. And I, this is a sort of long flap I've cut off, um, about a third of it. And then I'm cutting it into thick, big, thick chips, and then cutting those into um, chunks about ooh, a centimeter size. And there we go. Now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass that rest of that Swede over to the sous chef to chop up, put in the boiling water, with the rest of the stuff, because otherwise we'll be here for hours. Alan, can you pop all of that into the boiling water, please? Thank you. So let's start on the much easier stuff. My darling, may I have that board, that box back? Thank you. Right, here I have the other vegetables that I'm going to use today. in another ice cream box, I have to say. And I'm going to start off with an onion. Okay, now we use the onions all the time. And actually for blind people, they're not always the easiest things. So I'm going back to my vegetable knife, which is actually feeling a bit blunt. I'm going to resharpen this knife. That's better. It's just catching again on my skin. Penny. So here is my onion. Now there are all sorts of clever ways of doing onions. I'm afraid I'm doing a very simple version. So I've got the onion and I've got a pointy bit at one end and a pointy bit at the end and the base at the other. So this is the end of where the leaves came off. And I have laid it on its round slide. So I'm holding it really firmly with all the fingers and thumb with my left hand. And I'm now going to put my knife about ooh, an inch back from the end of end where the leaves came off and just cut it through. So I've cut off that end. I've turned, I've reversed the onion in my hand 
and I've got the base where the roots were. And again, I'm cutting back and my keeping my fingers really clear of it all the time. And you could hear the onion paper on it. Right, so now I can set this onion down. And this is probably something I've not really thought about enough before. I've set it down on a flat bottom where I've cut the bottom off, where I cut the roots off. So now I can measure with my finger and the knife and cut down, straight down from top to bottom. I've now got two halves of onion. And what I have is both sides, both halves of onion have got a rounded side, which still has got the onion skin on. And this is where you get really tricky with a blind person because you can't necessarily feel whether you've got all the brown skin off. And if you haven't, it doesn't taste very nice. And it gets, you know, it's quite tough. So one of the things to do is never be mean with your onion peeling. Be generous, even if it means taking off an extra layer, because at least that way, you know, you haven't got the brown skin. Mm -hmm. So I have now got the onion and it's a little dome Oh, I've got the sous chef is telling me I've got brown skin left on here. Ah. This is me. Oh, yes, I can feel it. Okay, there's the onion. It's like a little humpy thing sitting flat on the board. I've got flat ends um, on the left and the right. And now I'm going to cut it straight down the middle, which I'm measuring with my left hand. Down it goes. And then I'm going to, I've swung it around. So that cut that I've just made is now going left to right. And I'm going to cut three wedges at an angle. One, two, two cuts. And that is giving me, uh, what, I don't know, what, what could I call these? Sort of skin, not skins, pieces of onion. Because when I um, cook them in the oven, I don't want the onion just to collapse. I want it to be still of individual pieces. So I'm taking these wedges apart, taking each layer of onion out. So I've got little sort of triangular pieces of onion. So they're going to my box just to collect. Bing, bang, bosh. Now, what other vegetables did anybody get? Who's cooking along? Is anybody speaking to me? <laughs> They're all chopping. Supriya, were you cooking along? Uh, uh, hello, the, yeah, uh, audio un, um, muted. Uh, yes, I'm cooking. I've got mine in the microwave now, the hard veg. Um, yes. I've got carrots, parsnips, couldn't get fennel, which is a bit disappointing. Yep. Um, no sweet, but I've got all the others. Uh, no onions because my husband's allergic. Um, Sometimes I, I use onions. So I have to cook something separate for him. But today yeah. I didn't. Um, I love red onions, roasted red onions. I've got pepper. Yes. Uh, herbs, the, the rosemary and thyme from the garden. Yes. Garlic. Yeah, got everything else. Okay. I've just done half an onion. I'm just coming back to do the other half. And I'm going to be a bit more generous, I hope, with my peeling. If in doubt take an extra layer of onion off. Yeah. And that way, That's what I do. really mm. confident, it's all clean. Yeah. Then I'm yeah. doing that, I've got the ends, I'm cutting it in half, and then I'm doing my wedges. So each of these pieces of onion, I've cut into six pieces, and then I am just taking them apart so that when they go into the oven, they will um, cook more quickly. Um, and, and what we would like them to do is caramelize a bit, um, take on some color, all the rest of it. So there's the onion. And Alan will, Alan, can I get you to put those into the um, tray with, uh, I've already done one onion, to start us off. Okay, what have I got left? I'm going to do the easy stuff first. Here is a pepper. And I know this pepper's got a bit of damage on it. 
because I dropped it this morning and it skedaddled across the floor. <laughs> um, and then I had to try and find it with a foot. You know the feeling, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> you so, kick it across the floor again. And... Yes, I, I've, I've given up on tomatoes. If I drop a tomato, I just kick it into the side and leave it there for somebody else to find. <laughs> so I am now, I've cut out the little bit of damage that was on there and it has been washed since it's been on the floor. And on my right hand side, I've got the stalk of the pepper. And I know that all the seeds are attached inside the pepper underneath the stalk. So I've got the left, my finger, my forefinger of my left hand, just feeling the pepper. And I've got the very end of the knife and I'm just cutting round the base of the stalk. And you can feel it's all undulating because that's what peppers do. And I'm taking it round. And the idea is that I am going to take out the stalk and I'm pulling it. And there's the stalk out with all the seeds attached. And I'm turning the pepper upside down. I'm just checking that there are no more seeds in there. I'm just running around with a finger. You could be good and go and rinse it under a tap. But as I'm sitting here, I'm not going to go that far. So the other thing that's given me is another flat surface. So the pepper is now on the board and it's pointing up. So I've got at the top three little sort of pimples, which are the base of the pointy end of the pepper. And I'm going straight down the middle and I've cut it in half. And then I'm going to go laying the pepper down again Think about those flat edges all the time. It's what you're always looking for. So I've got half the pepper and I'm cutting it into long, thick strips. They're about three quarters of an inch wide. And then I'm going to cut these at angles to make triangular pieces. So I'm just turning my knife back and forwards to make each of those strips into about four, triangles so you've heard it go now here we go again so the first one i'm holding it with my left hand um, the knife is near my left forefinger and the knife is angled away quite strongly and that's going to give me a side of a triangle down it goes then i found the top of the triangle with my forefinger of my left hand and I'm cutting down with the angle, with the knife angled to the left this time. And that's the other side of the triangle. And then again and again. And what's that? What I'm trying to do as I do these vegetables is to have lots of different vegetables, different shapes. And I've got something really interesting to show you in a minute if I can make it work with a butternut squash. So I'm just going to finish off this pepper. And all I'm doing is literally cutting and twisting with my wrist to get these different shapes. And these are going to go into the roasting tin. The roasting tin, because I don't want too much mess washing up, what I've done is I've lined it with some heavy duty foil right up the side, nice and firm. And that is my sort of cooking platform. And I'm going to throw all these veg in. Alan, did I have a box? Thank you. So there's a pepper. So uh, I would use the same sort of methods if I was making a salad, but I would just cut it more finely. Thank you. And let's see what we've got next. Ah, courgette. No. Oh, the fennel. I found the fennel. Right. The fennel is a bulb, like celery, I suppose. And it's got fingers at the top, like it's where this, the fronds of the leaves came up. And it's been chopped off 
sort of a couple of inches from the bulb. So those will be a bit dry. So I'm just going to cut the very ends of those fingers off, feeling them with my finger of my left hand. Do you know, it's, it's, it's quite tricky having to describe this to you because yeah. one does it so automatically, I think. Right, turning, turning the fennel bulb round. So now I've got the bottom of it um, facing to my right. And I'm going to take the knife and I'm going to take off. That was me much harder. Could you hear it? Yeah. yeah. Cutting down. So now that I've taken off all the base where the roots would have been. And it's given me another flat surface. So again, I'm much more stable. And I've got these fingers and I'm picking the knife down between two of the fingers. Sorry, the fennel fingers, not mine. <laughs> and I'm going to go straight down. There it is, straight down. I'm going to take that fennel finger off the top and cut it in half. Um, so I've got two little sort of stubbets of finger there. And then I've got all this fennel. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to cut that lengthwise. So now, just like with the onion, I have got, um, what would you call them? Leaves, uh -huh. um, scales, perhaps scales is a good word. So where you take the fennel apart, like an onion, you have got different shapes and different textures. And we're breaking it down a bit so that it will cook more easily when it's being roasted. And so that, one's, that piece there has come into four sort of scales. I like fennel. It's a it's an interesting flavour. Gives you a bit of variety. Um, again, we're looking at different shapes in this meal, different textures, different flavours. You know, and for us who can't see, that can be quite important because you've got a suddenly got a clue as to what you're eating. So I'm coming back to the main bulb of fennel. I've got three more fingers sticking up. Fennel fingers, not mine. Going down between two cutting off the finger bit into two little stubs. Yeah, I hope nobody's recording this. It could sound quite cruel, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we are with our stubby fingers that we're chopping even smaller. I've broken it down again, and I'm going to have the scales. I'm sure there's a better word for it, but they that works for me at the moment. Flakes. Flakes, they're, they're flakes are a bit... These are much chunkier than flakes. Thick flakes. Thick flakes. Um, <laughs> I've got thick flakes of fennel. Thick <laughs> flakes of fennel. <laughs> it's not one to say after a few drinks, is it? <laughs> and actually, I've just realised I've got a bit of hard base at the bottom here. So I'm just cutting that off so that I can separate these flakes again. There we go. Last bit of the fennel, down through the last two fingers, crunch, and then stubby fingers, one stub, two stub. It's how you get little fingers. And then I'm cutting this last of it into about six pieces, flaking them off. And you can smell it, and it smells lovely fresh, different. I'm trying to decide what the flavour smells like, but if I said fennel -y, um <laughs> Anacidi. Anacidi, yes. That's, that's it, it. Anacidi. Yeah, yeah, I love fennel. fennel. You know, when you've got root vegetables, like um, we've got that great big swede and um, the carrots and potatoes, actually they, they're quite clumpy flavours. Um, these are going to be much fresher. Those are all flaked. Alan's going to go and pop them into my roasting pan. Is that water boiling yet, my darling? Is it on full whack? Okay, right. Off you go with those and let's see what we've got next. 
It's like a magical mystery tour. I'm saving <laughs> the horrible one to last. Uh, in the tray. In the tray, please. Yep, straight in the tray. What I've got now is a courgette. And do you remember I said I could make courgettini with my pencil sharpener? Um, you have to be careful because if you've got a, a courgette that's too thick, it, it will overwhelm the pencil sharpener. But young, young, fresh, you know, youthful courgettes are exactly what you need. Just like you. Yeah, yes, like you, yes. Um, and we often have courgettini with um, mushrooms, fried mushrooms, garlic, and um, spinach. Right. What I've done, I've done this without even telling you, haven't I? <laughs> I have just trimmed off the ends of the courgette. So uh, again, I've got flat ends at both ends and I'm now cutting it straight down the middle and I measure it with my hands really. And, you know, I say to you the middle, I have no idea and I don't care. Um, I've cut it in half. I'm then cutting it, each of the halves, they're still round all the way round and I've got it poised on one rounded side and I'm cutting that courgette in half again, down that length. So now I've got a half of the courgette and it's cut into two quarters. And I can go down them again. And what I'm looking for now is I'm gonna cut it into wedges, which are about ooh, less than a centimeter thick, but they are rounded on one side and then they are, um, pointed on the other. So I've got little segments of courgette. And again, this is about having different shapes so that when you and I are eating them, we've got some sort of clue as to what we're eating. So you can hear how quickly this courgette is. I'm standing the next one upright, going straight down the middle. I've got two flat surfaces, laying it down, coming down through the middle of the long section, cutting it into little round portions. I get, see, I know what I'm doing, but do you know what I'm doing? Can you understand what I'm doing? Yes. Yeah. 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 So if I picked up this piece of courgette, let me just describe it to you. It's, um, I've got a triangle that is about uh, ooh, getting up a centimetre thick. So it's triangular on one side, and one side of the triangle is rounded. So therefore, each piece of courgette has got a little bit of skin on it. So you've got the colour contrast again, that green skin against the white flesh. You've got the texture, and it's a different shape to the carrots or any of the fennel or anything else. So I'm gonna give that lot to Alan. And that can go into our roasting pan. Thank you, my darling. Ah, right. Before I start on the hard bit, which is the butternut squash, I'm gonna, now if I rustle this, do you know what it is? Garlic. Good, good, good. So, I'm rubbing that garlic through my hands. Can I take the board back, please? So let's talk about garlic cloves because they are can be a bit tricky. So the first thing is you have a bulb of garlic and that's the, the name for that overall thing that you get from the green grocers. And it's got this hard spike up the middle, which is where the leaves were originally. And then it's all covered in this papery skin. Now today I'm just going to do two cloves of garlic. Can I put it out? Okay. And somewhere on here, let me just find, aha, I have some interesting implements that I want to show you. The first of them is, it's a silicone tube. And it is about uh, four inches long on one side and it's cut at angles and the other side 
is about three inches long. And the idea of this is that you put your pieces of garlic inside the tube. I've got two pieces, two cloves of garlic inside the tube and you press down, listen. And what that is doing, hopefully, is removing the paper off the garlic and it's done it okay for one clove. And so I'm just gonna put the, the other clove back in. Listen. And that has loosened the paper on the garlic. So with a knife, I can just take off an end. It was a, a little device you were using there, did you say? It was, it was a little silicon garlic skin remover. Right. Very interesting. I, I would like one of those because I usually peel it and it gets under your fingers. Um, yes. Or yes. I had a tip from some magazine to actually yes. put it in the microwave for 10, 15 seconds, which I'm... makes it easier to peel. I've tried yeah. that as well, but sometimes they explode. <laughs> right. Well, I have... You're absolutely right, it is the smell. And of course, it, it, when you cut garlic with a knife, you, one, you're spilling the juice over you to make you smell, but also it makes everything much stickier. So this thing I've done, the other thing you could do is you can just put the piece of garlic, the clove of garlic on your board and press down. I'm using my left hand to demonstrate this. And you just roll your hand backwards and forwards. Now, you do risk getting garlicky that way, but if you don't want to spend money on one of these little tubes or have all the fag of washing it up, I just throw them in the dishwasher. Um, that's what you would do. So a hand would be just as effective, but you have to roll it and press down quite hard. Mm. Now I've got another little gizmo here. And you'll have seen garlic presses and all sorts of other things. This is, this actually came from the garlic farm on the Isle of Wight. And I expect you can get them on their website. And I'm sure there are other versions too. And what this is, it's um, a cylindrical object and it comes in half, it's got two halves and they run round inside each other. And on the bottom of each cylindrical object, which I think in a bar, they've got like finger nobbles so that you get a really good grip on it. Inside, it's inside the cylinder, it's divided into two. And on what this side here I've got on my board, it's got like little teeth all the way around it. And on the other one, the other cylindrical side, it's not got the little hole, it's got um, more teeth. And the idea is, I'm just gonna, roughly chop my garlic and put it into one side of this garlic, I don't know, what do we call it, mill? And it's got two sides to it, so I'm putting the, spreading the garlic into those two sides. So it's like a little cup with a divider down the middle, and that divider has got teeth. Is that to, to squash the garlic, Penny? It is. I, well, I don't know. Whether squ squash may not be the um, term. No, pre press <laughs> like a garlic press. <laughs> like a garlic press. Now, so I've got this sort of cup with a with a divider down the middle, and it's got some teeth in it. And I'm putting the top on it, which slips into the cup, and I press down with a bit of force. And then I've got those finger holes on both sides of my um, cylinder now and I'm turning them. Can you hear me do that? Yeah. yeah. And what that is doing is chopping up all my garlic, making it into garlic mush. And so that can all come apart. And at the bottom, I have got garlic mush. I can scrape it off the teeth on my top piece, which I suppose is more like a lid. 
And so I'm getting a bit garlicky now. And so I'm putting it into my bottom piece, into the little cuppy bits. So I've now got a cup of garlic mush, which Alan can go and spread all over the roasting pan. And that will all go in the dishwasher again. So um, nice and easy to handle. Right, here we go then. This is the difficult bit. This is the butternut squash. Now, the first thing with the butternut squash is that you don't always have to peel them because you, if you buy them in the autumn when they're fairly fresh, the skin is quite thin and you can actually just chop them up and eat the skin too. Okay, but now we are going to tackle this butternut squash. And this is a good reason for not buying the biggest ones that you can find because they are so uncomfortable to manage. What I'm going to do first is there's a top of the butternut squash, which is where it would have had a stalk coming into it. And then there's the bottom bit, which is where it probably would have sat on the ground. I don't know. OK, so I'm going to cut off the very top. And this is hard. Can you hear that? Mm, that yeah. Quite a bit of force. So be careful. I'm coming to the other end now. So this is the bulbous end. And I know that bulbous end has got um, the seeds in it. So I may, this is where if you had a big knife and you were confident with a big knife, you might go for it. But I, I'm going to be a blind person and I'm going to take this bottom off, possibly in two or even three pieces, because I do not want to risk my finger. So that's one piece off. And can I just remind you that if you cut off extra vegetable and waste it, it is much easier than cutting off extra finger and having to get it tacked back on again. Mm. So don't be mean about the vegetables. I'm cutting this quite generously off. And actually I can feel in there, there's a membrane that I've revealed, that I've gone through, and I can feel that the seeds have been there. So what I can do now is I've got my rubbish bin, and I'm gonna put my fingers through the membrane, and I'm running them round, all the way round, because of course it's circular, it matches the shape of the butternut squash. My fingers are in there, and I'm scraping out the seeds, which is a real advantage. So I've been, over generous by cutting off the bottom, but it's given me a perfect opening to get in there and get all those seeds out. And- Do anything seed... with the seeds? Pardon? Can you do anything with the seeds? Are they useful in other recipes? Well, um, butternut squash, I suppose you could try and dry them, but um, I have never done that. Mm. They smell so... a bit like a watermelon. Yes. Okay. yes. And you, you might be able to use them as you would pumpkin seeds. Because, of course, a squash is the same family as mm. pumpkin seeds. Um, but actually, I'm going to put them outside in the compost and the rats can have them. Now, I'm doing this with my fingers. Um, you might want to use a spoon. I would use a good stainless steel cooking spoon. Um, I'm doing it with my fingers mainly because it gives me the best sense of what's going on in there, whether there's anything left. Um, I'm doing it partly with my fingers by touch. I'm also doing it partly with my ears because I'm listening to the hollowness. I'm also feeling the, um, there was some squidgy sort of tissue that was holding the um, seeds in place. And I'm pulling that out and it's a bit sort of stringy and wetty and messy. So I'm going to have to watch that later on and make sure I get all of that out. Okay, so I still have a butternut squash. It has skin in it. And because I've only just bought it, I'm a bit cautious about trying to serve this without peeling it. And this is where my Y-shaped peeler comes into play. So 
I'm just clearing my board again, so I'm keeping clean. Right, so Y-shaped peeler, flat blade, not the one for um, making the um, little carrot pieces. I'm holding the bulb, bulbous end of this butternut squash in my left hand, left hand, and I'm pressing it hard down on the board so it's nice and stable. And I'm only going to peel the sort of, if I said nose end, it's like a trunk, like an elephant's trunk. And I'm just peeling that with my Y-shaped peeler. And I find this is the very best peeler for this. And I'm coming straight down it. Can you hear me doing that? Mm. Yep. Yeah. And I'm running my fingers down because actually my contact space with this peeler and because this is rounded is quite narrow i've only probably got hmm let me feel a piece yeah about quarter of an inch to half an inch of cutting blade onto the pump onto the butternut squash so i'm having to be quite careful to go round and check where i've been each time with this so that I'm getting enough off. Um, and I, it's coming off very, very fine. Um, finer than I was peeling the carrots. Um, this is mm, not quite paper fine, but a little thicker than that. But it's not like big lobs that you get off with the um, Swede and things like that. So this is doing a very fine job. And what it's also suggesting to me is that this butternut squash does not have very thick um, peel. Uh, what is, is it peel? What was the word you'd use? Skin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By the time you've done fingers and skin, it, this is getting <laughs> very, it's like a, a chopping up in a, Abattoir. Right, what I'm going to do now, taking my knife, I'm cutting off that long nosy part, the trunk part of my butternut squash. Now I know that sometimes you get seeds right up into that nose part. Depends how big it is. And this one, I'm lucky it doesn't, but I'm just going around the bottom of it now and tidying it up, seeing if there's any more skin. And again, this is peeling by touch because with um, the carrots and the swede, it was dry and rough. With the butternut squash, it's very smooth. And when I am feeling for it, I can feel a bit of peel there. It's smoother. But it and and it's drier, whereas where I've peeled it, it's just got that little bit of moistness. So that's quite important, right? So this is the difficult bit now. I've got the bottom of the butternut squash, and because I put my hand inside and taking out all the um, seeds, it's actually given me a handy handhold, so I can press it down on the board. I could put my hand, the fingers of my left hand inside it. And now I can bring this Y-shaped peeler all the way around to peel off the worst of the skin. And as we said, this, this butternut squash, because it's not so huge, the skin is not so thick, not so tough. So if I have some misses, it's not going to be the end of the world. But this, this handhold is really useful. Can you hear me sort of scraping <coughs> all over it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can't tell you how exciting this is. It must be just thrilling for you. No, I think the, the good idea with the, um, the hole that you've made there for your hand to go, you know, hold on to it. It's a very yes. good idea. 
Yeah. And so my fingers are in it and all my left palm is pressing down on this squash. So it's much more firm. Right, so I'm clearing my board again. And the reason I'm clearing my board is also because when I do the chopping, I don't want to then add bits of peel back into what I'm cooking. I expect you could be really neat and have one board for peeling and one for chopping, but life's too short. Okay. I'm just gonna start on the neck piece of this, the trunk, and I'm gonna go straight down the middle. And I'm sort of roughly feeling it. And I'm a blind person, so God knows where the middle is. So I'm going down. And again, if with an older one, you would need to check that you had got all the seeds out and they certainly do come up here. So make sure you're clearing that. And I'm going to cut this into like long chips down the whole length of the trunk. One, two, and they may not be very even. And then I'm going to cut those. Do you remember how we did the courgette? So we had the wedges, so we had the outside rounded and then um, a little pointy bit. So I've cut that trunk into half and then each of those halves are going to go into three and then each of those are going to make about four wedges each. So there they go. So it does, you know, this is a big, this is a lot of vegetables here. We're going to have these, um, we can have them with a meal, a casserole or whatever you want to do. We would often have them as um, just as a, as a, a light supper. Um, it freezes really well uh, once it's cooked. So we would cook, box up portions, um, get them out, let them defrost, throw them in the microwave. And there you go, there's a meal for two. So um, might serve it with some bread or something similar. Alan, please would you take away these pieces of butternut squash and they can go in the roasting tray. Yeah, no, they go straight in the roasting tray. Yes, you should have gone in already. Sorry. Right, now I've got this big bulby bit. And do you remember I cut the bottom off and I've got this big hole at the bottom. So just remember that because I'm at the top, I've put it down with the hole at the bottom. So it's fairly flat. And now I'm gonna cut through the top in the middle. And I want you to remember that the top is pretty tough because it had all that, um, sort of nosy trunky bit and when I get down lower I've got a great big hole so you need to think about the force you're using on this the speed at which you're putting it okay so lots of force to start with and then it just goes whizzing through and this is where you need to be careful because when you can't see your how you use your force of your knife you need to be really careful with so now I've got a half, so at the bottom I've got that nose that is all hard and then I've got this big sort of cup space which was where the seeds were. I can turn it over and again now I've got a nice flat surface so I can cut off the nose bit with that amount of force, cut that into wedges. Alert, your internet connection is unstable. Uh oh. Uh oh, and now I'm going to cut the cup part and it's much easier. So will you remember when you're cutting, you need to think about how hard your substance is and you're going to use different amounts of force for it. I'm now cutting the bit of the butternut squash that surrounded the seeds just between my hands, cutting it literally against my thumb because it doesn't take much force it's nice and easy and I'm just cutting it into little sort of cubes of butternut squash. So I'm going to go back to this other half and I want to remind you 
and I'm cutting off the end where the sort of bulb, the nose was, and that's much harder. I'm going to cut that into wedges and it's using more force. If I use this much force elsewhere, I would be using too much. I would be at risk of it all shooting across everywhere. And therefore the knife is loose and I'm going to likely cut myself. So back to cutting the bowl, the cup bit. And literally I could just do that now between my finger and thumb. And that's not too hard, dong, 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 much quicker. So learn to gauge the strength of the ingredients you have. Mm. And in a second, I'm going to show you our last ingredients, which are so much e softer and easier that um, take no effort at all. My darling, there's some stuff to go into the... Yes. Can I remind you about potato peelers? Try and keep them somewhere safe and not put them in your compost pot where they go out into the compost bin. <laughs> You'll never see them again. <laughs> I think that must have half a dozen um, potato peelers, vegetable knives, etc., etc., at the bottom of the compost bin. Yeah, <laughs> <done> it. <laughs> yeah. It's my way of improving the minerality of the soil. <laughs> Just in case the rats want to peel them just a little bit extra. Yeah. Now, my darling boy, I had some herbs here. Can you? Thank you. I put them on here. Are they here? I've got them. Right. Herbs. I've got two sorts of herbs. The rosemary. Here's a, a length of rosemary. And I know which end is which because... That's the growing way. So you can feel that the leaves are going up it. With the rosemary, you need to hold the stalk and just pull the leaves backward and off they come. Just like that. So really simple. Rosemary is much easier than thyme, which is boringly slow. So you're pulling the rosemary leaves against the way they grew up. So they would have all have been pointing upward in the air and you're gonna run them your fingers down the stalk and pull them off. Uh, Penny, how many sprigs are you using? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'm using about six, but they're quite small because our rosemary is very pathetic at the moment. So I, th and we've got a lot of vegetables here. Um, you could use as much as you like. Okay. okay? Um, my time is ultra pathetic. Um, so I've only got a couple of little, tiny little bits of that. It's the wrong time of year. Um, we're going to have to plant more rosemary, more thyme next year, I think. Um, so, but I'm pulling uh, the thyme leaves off. And what I'm doing is I pull all this lot off. They are s sort of falling into a heap on my chopping board. Because what I'm going to do in a moment is chop them. Now, I do have a very posh chopper. So um, some people would put them into um, a machine and you could just mill them, um, but then they're gonna end up more like a powder. Um, I have a, a half moon chopper that my mother gave me many years ago with two half moon blades that you can just um, roll onto your herbs. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of hassle to get out. It's another piece of equipment. Um, I'm just going to do this lot with a knife and just chop, chop, chop to get them um, small enough. And my, the only aim of chopping them is really so that if they go into somebody's mouth, somebody is not going to be gagging on a leaf. And certainly the rosemary leaves can be ooh, nearly an inch long and quite tough. So you're just trying to make them comfortable in the mouth. How, you know, what other things would you make comfortable in the mouth? The mind is boggling here. Um, I, I, I'm thinking chocolate, of course. Of course. Of course. And, and could you use, um, if you didn't have fresh rose for your time, could you use the, um, the jarred stuff that you get? I think you could, but I wouldn't add it at this stage. Right. It's dried. And so I would be adding it, um, oh, 
towards the end of my cooking period. Okay. okay. So we're going to cook this. And we're not hoping to show you this cooking. Can you hear me cutting these herbs? Yeah. Let me talk about how I'm holding them. So I've got them in my left hand. I am scrunching them together between my thumb and fingers. And I've got my um, forefinger of my left hand. And I've pushed that back about ooh, a centimeter or so from the edge of my herbs. And then my knife is going down that nail and it's leaning away from that nail and I'm cutting them. And because I'm using the flat of the knife against my fingers and I'm leaning it just slightly away, I am not gonna cut my fingers, which is not to say I don't cut my fingers because I do. Um, and from time, but no more, I think, than anybody else. Mm. It, it is about taking time, not rushing, using the right amount of force. I'm just gathering all these herbs back together again and giving them another cut through. And you can hear me just doing it quite simply and easily. And I know where the herbs are because I'm sort of walking my fingers back from the trail, the mound of herbs that I've got in front of them. And so the knife is actually not getting very close to my fingers at all. Right. Now, that is nearly my last ingredient. Somewhere I have got a roasting tin. Helen, may I have the roasting tin, please? I just lift this up. May it go down there. Okay, my goodness. This is a giant roasting tin. And in here is a huge layer of vegetables. And it is, this has layers of vegetables into which I am now pouring my herbs. Um, sorry, Penny, did you say we have to put the garlic first? No, I would no. certainly want my garlic to be covered. So I wouldn't put it last, okay? So, because garlic, sorry, you, both. garlic on the roasting tin first, is it? No, not necessarily. No. I have just put lots of stuff in here. So in here, I have the parboiled vegetables. I know they're here because I can feel them. They're just soft, okay? I have got my fennel and carrots and courgette and herbs. Yeah and onions and garlic, and I am stirring them up with my hand. My darling, have we put some oil in here? Not yet. Please may I have some oil. We're going to liberally cover this with oil. And this is why I'm going to do this messy bit now. <laughs> Any particular oil? Olive oil, I think it's said. Well, I, um, would, I would prefer to use olive oil. Maybe no, it doesn't make any odds. I'm going to get covered anyway. <laughs> so do I put the chili? I'm using the chili. Do I put that with the oil and then uh, drizzle it over the veg? What sort of chili is it? Uh, I've got chili flakes. Okay. Are they dried? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I would hold on to those. My concern would be that they may get burnt. Because they're already dry. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, yep. Yeah. Alan, pepper, and salt, please. Just the garlic, rosemary, and or um, in olive yes. oil. Yes. If you've got dried rosemary, dried chili, dried garlic, again, put them in halfway or a little later, so that they don't boil. Uh, they don't burn. Right. That pepper in. Yeah. Salt. I love that you're using your hands, Benny, because that's how I cook as well, because you can feel what oh, you're doing. Uh, yeah, I'm using my can hands. Can I tell you why I'm doing this? The whole point about filling this um, tray with foil was that I wasn't going to have a, a miserable job cleaning it afterwards. <laughs> if I put in a spoon, there's a real risk that I'm going to put the spoon through the foil, even though it's a good quality foil. Yeah. 
I tend to flick things out of the tray or whatever I'm doing if I use yeah. a heat pencil. Yep. And, you know, if, if one was doing it properly, we're now communing with our food, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Actually, we're just making less mess and um, making sure we've got everything done. Everything exactly. Covered. Now, Alan has still not managed to get the Swede in here. Swede's, uh, just Swede is being drained. He's going to come plomping in here. And then all of this is going to go into um, a hot oven. I'm going to use it at six. Sometimes you could put it even higher, but I'm going to put this in at six for um, half an hour. Sorry, yeah, what? I'm six? Guess mark six, 200 degrees Celsius. Oh, okay. Okay. It's going to go did in you, half an hour. Did you toss the veg in the oil or did you make sure all the oil was yes, mixed up? Okay. Lovely. Okay. So thanks. I've got the oil into this um, pan. I might even have a bit more, Alan. Please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This sweet is a bit hot. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is a pan of vegetables. Lovely. That would feed, I have no idea. I would have thought six to eight people very comfortably. There's a lot of vegetables here. So they're going to go into the oven, top shelf, guess mark six, 200 degrees centigrade. They're going to be there for half an hour, then they're going to come out and they are going to be gently turned over. And the gentleness is one, I don't want to break up the vegetables, I don't want mash, and two, I don't want to pierce the foil. They're going to go in and they're going to go back in for another half hour. At the end of that half hour, if you want some more caramelization on your vegetables, you might turn the heat to Top whack for five, ten minutes, not too long. But all you're trying to do is get some really you no know, chewy, not quite not burnt, but caramelized bits mm. on the edge. And that is roast vegetables with some chopping ideas. Now, Alan, can you take that away? I'm gonna let you go and put that in the oven. I want to just talk to you about um, other things that you could put in here. So you could put in, for example, chopped tomato. That would give you a bit more juice, a bit more steaming, um, a different flavour. Um, what we could also do is we would put in um, chopped up chorizo sausage or other sausages, um, and that would give you a meat and vegetable dish. What else might you put in there? What do you think? Potato? Would you bung potato in there? Yes, I've got three potatoes in mine. Of course, yes, sorry, you've you done potato in yours. Uh, can you do uh, bro broccoli or cauliflower? Um, I would not. Um, no. Because, because they are, um, they're actually the flowers of the plants and they're, they're going to cook in a different way. Now, there's no reason why you can't do roast cauliflower and roast broccoli but um, they will cook at a different speed to everything else. Yeah. And yeah. they will give up different amounts of water. Oh, can you switch it on? Very noisy. Thank you. Um, what else could you put in there? What other vegetables have you got? Sweet potato. Sweet potato. Yeah, I've definitely oh, done yes. sweet potato. You could put it, you could put pumpkin in instead of the butternut squash or in addition to the butternut squash. How about um, beetroot? Beetroot would be very interesting. Um, I think purple beetroot would bleed. And so you might end up with quite a, um, a, a, a colored um, mix. Um, we put in, um, oh, what was it? Um, what did I put in the recipe? Uh, oh, um, vinegar. What's that sort of vinegar? Balsamic vinegar. Balsamic vinegar. Ah, yeah. That, that came out very interesting in flavour, but I gather it was because it was quite a, 
a dark, sweet um, balsamic vinegar, the color of the ingredients was rather more uniform. So I didn't put it in this time because I wanted to keep some of the, the, the ingredient colors. Black garlic. Yeah, oh, we've done it with black garlic as well. Again, that's from the Isle of Wight and that's fermented. And that's quite interesting. Um, so you can add um, meat that doesn't need much cooking. Mm -hmm. Because don't forget, although you're cooking it for an hour, it's a very dense mass and you would need to check that your meat is properly cooked. Okay. I could put in, for example, ham. Ham is usually cooked. I've got, I've got some air dried ham in the freezer. Chop that up and pop it in. If I was doing it with ham, I might have cut the vegetables smaller and then I would put it into um, a tart um, with a bit of the liquid and it would be a, a delicious little, um, you know, main course starter, supper, whatever you wanted to do. What do you think so far? What are your tips on cutting up? Mine are very similar to yours, Penny. Well, especially the peeling side of being able to feel the skin, then the, the wetness of the um, mm. of the vegetables you're chopping up. That's how I do mine. And I always use a Y-shaped peeler. Um, I just get on with that better because we're all different, aren't we? Whatever we find. Very much so. Use. Yeah. Um, and chopping wise, I tend to do the same technique where I'm using my left hand. Or actually, I cut with my left hand and hold with my right for some reason. Um, are, are you right-handed or left-handed? I'm both. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. Hey, cool. Yeah. Hey, how amazing. How I know. Whenever someone lays a table for me, I always swap the knives and forks back around because I need it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> but well, no, uh, yeah. I, I, uh, Susie was on here earlier. And I think she's, she's teaching up at Farnborough College and we've been corresponding about... Um, how blind people eat. Mm. And when you have no sight at all, it's really difficult. So yeah. um, I spend a lot of my time chopping because I often cut up my vegetables like this so that when I'm eating, I only have to use a fork because yes. that's just so much easier. Um, or if I'm out at a restaurant, I have no hesitation about, you know, I'll have the chicken but please would you ask the chef to cut up the meat for me? Very. Could you just say oh. with the fennel, yes. do, you, do you take any of the outside off or what, just wash it? Oh, I'm going to wash it and yeah. chop it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and if, if people don't know what a fennel bulb looks like, if you take your fist, curl your thumb in and actually that bottom bit of your palm would be fatter and so think of that as the bulb at the bottom and then you've got those finger bits yeah. sitting up and that's where the fronds came out and when they cut and prepared the fennel to sell it they took off the fronds just as if you were taking off your fingernails and so you've got those finger bits that we then cut off and made into little even smaller stumps Film's not the most well-known, but I'll tell you what else I would put in this. Um, I would put in aubergine. Mm. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. We've done, you know, what else do you get as summer vegetables? Uh, fennel, of course. Um, mm, I'm, I'm, I know. I'm, all sorts of different, the, the, the key thing is that to decide which of these need par cooking. So often I think it's probably, probably, don't hold me to this, it's the root vegetables. So it's the potatoes, the carrots, the swede, the turnip. Um, those I'm par cooking. So they all went into um, a pan covered with salted cold water, brought up to the boil, boiled for uh, two, three minutes. They don't need to be fully cooked, just getting them going drain them, throw them into the, the um, foil line, lined roasting tin with all the rest of the vegetables. Those all go in raw, stirred up, into the oven, bing, bang, bosh. Lovely. I, I suppose you could use the stump of a broccoli. 
because that's oh, a bit I, I, I use broccoli stumps all the time. Yeah. Um, I use them as um, um, f with dips. And I, some of the, it depends. Sometimes I would peel them and sometimes not. I would cut off the base where it's got a bit dry. Yeah. Um, if I'm storing broccoli in the fridge, um, whether it's purple sprouting or, you know, the, the big green sort of Christmas the tree shaped ones, I would yep. always cut off the base um, and put a little water in the bottom of a box, an ice cream box, and sand it up and then it continues to grow. And oh, if right. it's weak, um, purple oh. sprouting is the same. Cut off, just think about flowers. They are flowers. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you cut off the bit that's got dried, put them in a little bit of water, you know, an inch um, in the bottom of the fridge and you'd be amazed how they perk up. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. There's the tip of the day there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm glad <laughs> I mentioned this. What we do this week? <laughs> but that's what okay. I do with celery. Does that work for me? Yes, yes. With, with, with the celery, I cut off a very thin sliver at the bottom of the celery. It goes into a ceramic celery pot, but it could just be a plastic pot, into the fridge with a little bit of water. And then I would change those waters um, once in a while um, because, you know, they'll get a bit slimy and horrible. But, you know, you're, you're probably not going to do this for very long, two, three days, but you'll be staggered at the change in your broccoli. Um, I have a, a tip about knives and I have yes. a question, Penny. Um, yes. The, the knives I use, they're almost always serrated because I find them easier to use and easier to chop with. And also the tip of the knife, this was my husband's idea, is always rounded. So if I accidentally poke my left hand finger with the, the tip of the knife, I don't cut myself. So I always use the ones with the rounded end. Right. I think that's... That's good advice. I think um, we will always find that these implements, it depends who you are, how you yes. use your hands and all the rest of it. My, I'm just coming back to you know, listening to you. My knife is actually pointed. Um, I wouldn't have known. And that's why I had to go and check because I don't touch myself that much with it. No, what, no, you don't. But just in case, you yes, know, for, for accidents, I, pref I I just feel safer with a rounded tip, shall we say. Um, and yeah. if you feel like that, there's no reason why you shouldn't round your tips, you know, or get somebody to do it, not knock the ends off you. I'll tell you what mm. I also, as a great tip, is um, knife blocks. I have a knife block that is filled with, they call it straws. So instead of having a knife block with sort of slits in it, whereas a blind person, you're f trying to feel with the end of this knife where the slit mm. is to put it in. These are full of straws and you just find the edge of the knife block, find the straws with the tip of your, with the tip of your knife and push. And it just goes mm. in. Oh, wow. Uh, mm. And yeah. it's much, much easier. <laughs> Any other bits of kit anybody wants details of? A pencil sharpener sort of, for doing the courgette courgettini mm. yeah they bought me that this was another present and they bought it from somewhere um i i will find out brilliant and Thank where you. They got it from yeah and, and, <laughs> and i'll tell you what it's wonderful for carrots too and because when you sharpen it um it ends up leaving a, a sort of proboscis that comes out and it's where you've circled the carrot or the courgettini. And it comes out like this long, narrow tube, not even a tube. And, and, it, and it comes out. So you've got all this stuff, the, 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 the whirls that come out the side. And out of the end comes this long proboscis. <laughs> <laughs> like an excruder. What? Like an excruder. Extruder, yes, you're yes. the extrusion. Yes, you're absolutely right. But um, yes, gadgets are really. Has anybody else got any gadgets they would strongly recommend? Mm. 
grater that you don't need to touch the grater. I have one of those. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, it's a bit fiddly to assemble and uh, disassemble, but it's good if you... I don't like grating very much with, with my fingers, no, no, fingers especially when the pieces it, get smaller and smaller. You yeah. can get gloves for grating. I have got some, but there's oh. a fact because I used was always grating my knuckles with doing oh. cheese. Yes, oh. that's what I'm worried oh. about. But they're special sort of gloves to wear when you're grating, but I don't I don't really bother getting them out. I, t I forget about them. So it's one of those things of how sad and how long is life, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tell you what I have is I have. Um, I think they were made for cheese and it's like an oval plastic container and the grater sits on top of it. And oh, so my son's got hold, that to take to uni. Yeah, he's got one. You, you hold the, 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 the base with one hand and then you rub your cheese or um, carrot up and down with the other. You will never get it right to the bottom. I'm trying mm. to think. Um, you could get a greater attachment on your food processor and stuff yeah. it down there. Um, but actually, I find this little bowl thing works really well. And, you know, when we can't see, you, making a mess is so easy. Yeah. You have all that stuff going into the bowl, which is covered mm -hmm. and it can't creep out, is, is really super. Right, so... Uh... Yeah, so our next baking session will be on the Monday, the 14th of February. Uh, my anniversary day, wedding anniversary, by the way, so that keeps me oh, to remember. Right. Um, <laughs> How romantic. Yes, yeah, so he only chose that date so he wouldn't forget when it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Typical bloke, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, great day. Um, so as, as, as most of you know, this has been recorded and we will be um, editing it and putting it up on our YouTube channel. And if you have registered, as you all have, to be on this baking session, you will receive uh, the link to the YouTube channel. Okay, you will receive the link. <laughs> Someone's Alexa's going off. That is fine, I'm with you. I love live TV. Hillary, Hillary's changed to Alexa somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we, we'll link that too. And Penny will uh, send across the links to other things mentioned in today's um, session. And we will get that in the uh, email to you as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all on the 14th of February. Okay, uh, we'll, thank you. We'll thank you. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Penny. That was fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Penny, and we'll see you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. 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 B